Hello, and welcome to this week's episode of Historically Drinking. If you like this kind of content, all booze-soaked history, then hit the subscribe button below and then the notification bell so that you know about our future episodes coming out. This week's episode is on Repeal Day. And I have a very fun announcement at the end of the episode, so stick around for that. Prohibition in the United States ended December 5th, 1933, with the passing of the 21st Amendment, which made legal the sale, the transport, and the manufacture of alcohol in the United States. Today, my historical drinkers, is the anniversary of that great day. In honor of that anniversary, we're making a Scotch highball, which is claimed to be the first drink that was finished after ratification of the 21st Amendment. Let's get started on our highball. First, we need our highball glass. So this is gonna be 12 to 14 ounces, straight sides, pretty narrow glass like this one. And to this, we're gonna add an ounce and a half of our Scotch whiskey. Of course, a highball can be made with any spirit. You could make a vodka highball, a gin highball, a rum highball, whatever kind of highball that you want. We're using a blended scotch for this, Monkey Shoulder, which is really, I love Monkey Shoulder for um, making drinks with. Now, there are only three ingredients in a highball. So it's really critical to make the best highball that you can, that you use the best ingredients that you can. There is no room for anything to hide in this drink. So your soda water is the second ingredient. I'm using Fever Tree soda. The reason that I'm using this is because it's highly carbonated. The bubbles are little and there are a lot of them. If you use soda water from like your soda stream at home, for instance, or even a lot of other brands of soda water, the bubbles, there's not gonna be a ton of bubbles and there's, they're going to be bigger bubbles and it's going to become flat much more quickly. Some, like I know when I use my soda stream for highballs, it becomes flat almost immediately. So it's really not ideal. So my favorites are this Fever Tree soda water and also Topo Chico makes excellent, excellent soda water um, to use in your highballs. So I added the soda water and the whiskey to the glass first so that they could blend themselves together, uh, negating any need for me to stir, to stir or do anything else to this drink except add the third ingredient, which is ice. Now, the ice, the bigger the ice cubes you can use, the better. I've got fairly big ice cubes. Um, I've got an ice cube tray that makes pretty big cubes. They could be a little bigger even. But really what's, what's important as, is that you don't use those really thin ice cubes like the one that comes from an automatic dispenser on the front of your refrigerator, for instance. Don't use those like really thin and very crumbly ice cubes because they're just gonna melt very quickly into your drink. And that's gonna make your bubbles go away. You don't want your bubbles to go away. Okay, so there we are. That simple, the Scotch highball. Let's take a taste and see how we like it. Mm, that is delicious. It's light, there's not a ton of Scotch in there. So it's really, it's a lighter drink. It's super refreshing, just super easy to drink. Ah, cheers, happy repeal day. So in 1933, the year of repeal, Americans didn't really have TVs in their living rooms yet, so they went to the movie theaters. The Marx Brothers were very popular on the big screen. Their movie Duck Soup came out that year. Another movie that came out that year was the original King Kong starring Faye Ray. 
at home, Americans were listening to the radio, and The Lone Ranger debuted in 1933. The Dust Bowl was happening, and Americans were smack dab in the middle of it. So there were a lot of people that were leaving their homes and moving themselves to new places where they could hopefully gain some more prosperity. We were also at the tail end of the Great Depression. Thank goodness it was almost over at this point. During all, in the midst of all of this, on December 5th, at 3.32 and 30 seconds p.m. Mountain Standard Time, the state of Utah, of all places, became the 36th state to ratify the 21st Amendment, making it law and getting rid of the 18th Amendment which of course was prohibition. Now, who was it that claimed this first post-prohibition drink? It was a man named Ben D. Caceres. And forgive me if I mispronounced his last name. I did try to find the proper pronunciation and couldn't find any information. Um, he was a writer and a bon vivant, and you know he was waiting at the bar. He had the bartender in front of him with a drink ready to give it to him. When that announcement was made that Utah, Utah had ratified it, Ben took his drink and he slugged it down. I'm not going to slug mine down, but he slugged his down. He finished it in less than three seconds. So, he claimed that he was the first person to finish a drink after the ratification. There were others that made this same claim. One was Oscar Mayer, that's right, Oscar Mayer of Wiener fame. And also our boys, the Marx Brothers, who said that they just started Harpo drinking the day before, and then he just kept drinking straight through, so obviously he was the first person to finish a drink. Now, in reality, of course, lots of people were having a drink at the same moment, a drink that had been served to them legally across a bar top for the first time in 14 years. So nobody can really claim this honor, but it is a good story. Also, the sale of low alcohol beer and wine had become legal through the Cullen Harrison Act on April 7th, 1933. This was signed into law by President Roosevelt um, as part of his first 100 days. And it was one of the things that helped bring the depression to an end because it created so many jobs. This final piece, um, the of the legalization of the sale and manufacture of hard alcohol would create even more jobs and help even further bring the end of the Great Depression. So woohoo, alcohol, huh? And really, really, as far as the people who were drinking the alcohol went, drinking it was never illegal. It was illegal the entire time to drink, or it was legal the entire time to drink. What was illegal was the sale, the manufacture, and the transportation of alcohol. Now, when the ratification took place, people went crazy, right? No, actually no, not really, they didn't. I mean, there were a lot of people in bars, and you can see pictures of people thronging the bar, with bartenders reaching over, everybody trying to get drinks out as quickly as possible, but it pretty much was limited to that. There weren't like people in the streets partying, none of that. It really, the whole event passed with a lot of fanfare, but pretty mild celebration, surprisingly. And part of this might have been because there may actually have been less places available to drink on that day because, of course, there were a ton of speakeasies that had been operating during Prohibition, and many of these did not open up after the ratification of the 21st Amendment immediately because they didn't have the proper licensing yet and they were waiting for the proper licensing. 
So people might just not have had as many places they could go. Now, there were some places that were ready to go immediately. They jumped on this thing. And you can see in a lot of places, if you look at the, the established date of, of older bars, you can see that it's 1933, which means one of two things. Either they whipped up their stuff real quick and got ready and were able to open a bar, get their licensing and open a bar very quickly in 1933, or they were already operating as speakeasies, which was very often the case. They were already operating as a speakeasy and it was very easy for them to just make the segue and open up legally. All right, that's it. Ah, happy repeal day. What a cool day. I'm really glad that we can drink legally, aren't you? Or, or that we can buy alcohol legally that we can sell alcohol legally, that we can transport alcohol legally, and that we can manufacture alcohol legally. That's a good thing. As always, I am accepting tips on Venmo. You can find me at Sarah LM Mangoni. Um, today, I, well, yesterday, we had to put my very, very sweet kitty to sleep after a, a long struggle with cancer. So 50% of any of the tips that I receive this coming week from this episode, I'm going to be donating th to the Treehouse Humane Society, which is in Chicago, which is where I adopted her from 18 years ago. <sighs> to Florence. Okay, now for the promised big announcement. I really appreciate everybody who has become a regular viewer of these historically drinking videos. I, your support means a lot to me and this has been such a hard year and these videos have really, they've, they've made a big difference for me. So to say thank you as a holiday present, I had this bottle of Angel's Envy engraved. This is Historically Drinking Family 2020. This is a special Art of the Blend edition of Angel's Envy that was made especially for the place that I have been working, the Pacific Hideaway. Um, so I have this. And then the folks at Angel's Envy were nice enough to hook me up with some additional things. So I have these great tasting glasses. There's two of them. A little Angel's Envy notebook and some Angel's Envy vinyl stickers. This Angel's Envy mixing glass. To go with all of that, I have a, a beginner's mixing kit. There's a muddler, a strainer, a wine key, and a jigger with a little canvas bag to keep all of it in. So anybody who comments on this video this week is going to be entered into a lottery. Next Friday, before I shoot next week's videos, I will draw a name I'll do a random name generator lottery on the internet and whoever's name is drawn is going to win all of this stuff. All right, so please comment below. <sighs> all right, well, thanks for being with me today. Again, happy repeal day and take care. Cheers. <laughs>